Thank you for joining our session. Um, we're going to go through how to create a collaborative culture, but we're going to do it through some examples of turnover time, which is one of the things that uh, most ORs struggle with, and it's a good way to form your collaboration. I'm Lee Hedman. I'm the Executive Vice President for Surgical Direction, and my whole professional career has been in healthcare, both on the hospital side and practice management side. And many years ago, got involved in uh, anesthesia practice management and found that the anesthesiologists and the groups were really held hostage to what was going on in the OR. And that's how we really came to start um, surgical directions. And Dr. Blasco will talk a little bit more about that. Um, surgical directions has been around for over 20 years. We've been in about 350, pushing 400 hospitals all over the country. We have two of our other colleagues with us. Yvette Stanley is the Director of Sales and Delivery, and our Marketing Director is um, Alex is with us. And we'll also have a booth, so please stop by. I think it's booth 202, 102, 102, and see us throughout the day. Um, part of what we do is consulting different uh, aspects of the OR. So today what we're going to go through are some um, ways in which you can start to collaborate and, and bring your groups together. As most of you know, hospital ORs are in an ever-changing environment with healthcare. There's so much unknown as to what's going on. And unfortunately, as you can see, the hospital profits have dropped dramatically and that continues to happen. And the hospital ORs make 68% of the hospital's revenue. But when is the last time you saw your CEO come down to the OR? Probably never. So one of the things we talk about with collaboration is actually bringing administration more in line with what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis so they can help understand some of the challenges and a lot of the good things as well that are going on, but so they, they understand more about it. Parents and patients are now leading our change as to how we should get our own health care. So years ago, you just went to your community hospital or if somebody told you they had gone to a surgeon, you would go to the same surgeon. And today, because of the internet and social media, we have options, right? We all can go on and we can research um, a surgeon for whatever procedure we need to have and see how many, how many procedures uh, he or she has done, what the outcomes have been. We can look at the hospital and see what patients are saying about the hospital. So it's very important for all of us in this room that are delivering healthcare every day to really focus on the patient experience even though we have a lot to do during our day, but always think about how would you feel if you were the patient? Hospitals continue to lose patients and it's because so many procedures are now outpatient and they're done in the ASC. Um, I'm one of those patients that ended up going to an ASC for my shoulder surgery because it was easier and there was a great doctor there. I had a great referral from Dr. Blasco and that's how you go about getting your healthcare today. So you know you can pull right up you can go in, you know they're pretty efficient, you're gonna get out, you're gonna have everything that you need. And hospitals seem to have a lot more hoops to jump through, a lot more hallways and those type of things, so it's a lot more difficult. So again, everything that we do today, we need to figure out if I were the patient and I had to walk that far and I wasn't feeling good, how would that make me feel? Would I tell my neighbor to come here next time? There are a lot of things that are being put into place to create a lot more efficiencies like ERAS and the surgical home. And we as consultants with surgical directions are starting to really focus a lot on that, but it is taking some time to get off of the ground. This is typical, yes. Enhanced recovery after anesthesia. And the surgical home is after you go home. So we're making sure that when you're ambulatory, and Dr. Blasco is our clinician, he'll talk about this, but that you have your home health set up, you have somebody there to greet you when you come home and your stairs are what you need or whatever. This is typical of the operating room. So it hasn't changed much in all of the years. So that's what we have to focus on, how we can change that. So in our culture, we really have to figure out what's going on in the hospital. What are the set of values and goals of the hospital? And we're in hospitals, um, all of us every week. And you'd be surprised you go in the boardroom and the mission and goals are posted. You may see them in the hallway. But if you ask somebody what the mission is of the hospital, they can't recite it. It's on your internet, your webpage. And it's really important, especially as hospitals have moved to health systems, that you understand what the ultimate goal is so that you're really focused on changing the culture step by step and being a part of it on a daily basis. 
So what comes first, process change or culture? What do you guys think? So the hospital culture, why is it hard to change? One of the reasons are, you know, when uh, physicians go through school, they're not taught to be leaders. They're not taught to be team players. They're there to do their job, to go in, focus on the patient, um, do no harm, and make sure that everything goes well. And we still want them to focus on that, but we also want them to, to come into our team so that we can all do it together and have better outcomes for the patient. Leadership and management models. Again, I talked earlier that the C-suite rarely would come to the OR, but yet it generates most of the income for the hospital. So it's very important. Um, we have a lot of uh, nurses in the C-suite as well that don't, have not been OR nurses. So we need to help educate them. And I know you guys probably go through that. And anesthesia, we need to really focus and bring anesthesia into the loop and not just look at them as, you know, possibly, you know, uh, not uh, hospital employees and they just come in, they're contracted. We want them to be part of the organization. And if we're not doing that and guiding the decisions that should be made for the patient, chances are that there could be a bad outcome. And unfortunately, there's a lot of human error that goes on. And today, when we look at you know, the surgical checklist and all the different things that are in place, we need to um, make sure that we do it every patient every day. So many places don't focus on that. They may have it posted in their OR when we go in, and we, we observe and we look and nobody focuses on the, uh, the, uh, the time out. Um, if we go on an airplane, which all of us will today, tomorrow, if they didn't do their checklist, you know, it would, be, it would be scary, right? So we all have to focus on what's right for the patient. Part of what we said, or what I said earlier is that um, we work in silos. Right, nursing comes in, they know what they need to do to pre-op the patient, get the patient ready to push into the OR. Anesthesia knows what to come in, talk to the patient, make sure that every the patient understands everything. Surgeon needs to get the consent sign, do the site markings, and get in the OR. So what we're gonna talk a lot about today is how do we all do that together? Because we all have our job, but we need to coordinate, we need to look at the clock, we need to look at the patient, the patient's family, and make sure that that goes well. So one of the things Surgical Directions has um, been very well known for is putting together a governance committee. It's not a typical OR committee that you guys are all probably accustomed to for years, where you know, nurses pretty much are the ones that are sitting down and trying to figure out what the next steps are or what process change should be put in place. And today we, wrote, we really bring those, those four silos together, the surgeons, anesthesia, nursing, and administration, a couple of times a month to start to really sit down and say, what are the challenges, what works right, what do we need to change, and how are we gonna do that? And then agree to move forward so that if a surgeon is only at your hospital maybe twice a week, he or she comes in, we want them to step right in and know what we're doing to move the process forward in our hospital. Nurses and anesthesia, sometimes anesthesia is at multiple places, especially if there's an ASC, but we want them to understand how we're moving it forward. And to put all of those different groups of people together is what we call collaboration that's very needed so that we reduce the error rate and we really take better care of the patients. So this is one of the pictures that I believe Dr. Blasco took some time ago. And this illustrates, you know, what's collaborative. This nurse is working by herself. And over here we have parallel processing. Everybody has a job to do and they're moving forward. And again, as we talk about turnover time today, that's one of the things every single hospital we go into, we ask, what is your biggest challenge? And they'll say turnover time. Turnover time and first case on time start, which are key. If you have a team doing it, it's going to go a lot smoother. So with improving turnover times, um, we correlate what needs to be done so that we have that collaborative culture. And there's three things that we need to focus on. Leadership and governance, which we talked about, but then we also look at the data and everything to take to management and show them where we were, where we were benchmarked, what our goal is, and how we're gonna get there through a gap analysis, and then work on a daily basis to evaluate what's gone on, possibly through lean daily management, observations, there's some new sophisticated polaris and different things like that that you can put up so that people can see it live 
so that everybody takes part of it and everybody owns it. And then also the process improvement. So on a day-to-day -day basis, we have to make sure that we're following whatever process we put into place, do a pilot, see if it works. And if it doesn't, tweak it, get everybody's interaction from it, not just management's. I mean, the people that are turning over the rooms, whether they're from EVS or they're nursing, or sometimes they're CRNAs that are helping to turn over the rooms, we have to make sure that we incorporate their thoughts because they're the ones doing the job. And it's always better when you're changing a culture to get people to talk versus sitting in their you know, silo, so to speak, or going to the locker room and kind of having some banter about what happened. It's better to get it out in the open and change it on a day-to-day -day basis until we get it down to a science. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Blasco. Dr. Blasco is one of the founding partners of Surgical Directions, and he's our senior medical director. He too has been all over the country um, with all of us, and he's mentored a lot of physicians throughout the country and really made a lot of change in the ORs. Is that the thing? Yeah. This is the thing, huh? Okay. All right, so she has a question. What comes first? Process change or culture change? I heard it's kind of mumbling here. Process, absolutely. Another question. Who works in the hospital? Who works in the ASC? Okay. If I walked into your hospital, my daughter staff, my nursing staff, and I said, who's the, who's the customer over the section? If I walked into an ASC and I asked, who the customer was over the section? That's right. Huge difference. Huge difference. Um, so I'm an anesthesiologist, intensivist. My career started um, training in California. My career started in Northwestern. Um, I spent a lot of time. <clears throat> I put my first notes on in 1976. At that time, was, I didn't know what ASC was. Now, uh, another question here. Uh, this guy in the corner over here, this is for you. Here, multiple choice. Of the 60 million procedures done a year, how many are stay in the hospital all the night? Is it 10 million? Is it 20 million? Is it 30 million? Well, we stay over 60 million a year. I say 10. You're right. We are now facing one of the most dramatic transformations in healthcare in the history of our of our country's surgery care system. People are, are piling out of the hospital as fast as they can get themselves out of it. It's at one time it was surgeon bringing because they could share gain sharing on these ASCs. And again, you know, I'm looking at the California person, she probably has gain sharing her ASC, probably owned by surgeons and a management company or more surgeons sold. This particular um, this particular scene right here was taken in an ASC about three or four years ago. That was a total joint. So we're doing outpatient total knees and total hips. In a freestanding surgeon on the ASC, what do you think the turnover time was between these two cases? 15 minutes, actually 12 minutes. Okay, but I'm going to go back a little bit. Now, this slide here, which is taken in upstate New York in a wonderful hospital. This woman has a master's, has a master's degree, CNR, and this is between total hips. How long do you think those turn over? Yeah, yeah, right. Okay, so let's get into the. Now, Lee said very eloquently that our shtick, and I'm saying certain people should stick, but really it's our shtick because it, you know, most people come to this conclusion that the only way you get hospitals to begin to quit acting like hospitals, more like ASCs, is to develop a collaborative leadership model. Now, in your operator, in most of your operators, I bet you have a surgery. Is that correct? Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And who owns the surgery? Staff. staff. This is different. This is owned by the administration and it's in charge of operations. Much, much different. So, okay, of the four agendas here hospital leadership, anesthesia, nursing, and surgeons, who has the most to learn about running an operator? Leadership. Leadership. They don't have a board. How does most hospitals work? Surgeon wants to have a, for example, last week somebody said he wants to get a, a, a Maser X spine robot. Right. One guy does a couple of spines a month, and he wants to get this is a four room operator. And so 
what did he do? How did he goes to the nurse director and she says, I want to buy a laser X, it's only about a million bucks. <laughs> so what did she do? She basically, I you know, my pay rate. So where does the guy go next? Administration. Pounds on the door. What's he going to say to administration? I need it now. Patient safety. If I don't get it, I'm leaving. Yada, yada, yada. Brett? Yeah. Right. So you have here a much different model. From now on, that surgeon with the laser X had presented to this committee and his peers. Let me show you an actual example here. This is actually, we just changed all the names to protect the innocent, but this is a Florida. Big Florida and uh, Southeast Florida. It's still in operation. It's been about 10 years. 10 years? At least 10 years. And and we have representatives, you can see, from all the different specialties. What do you think they said when Dr. X said, I really need this because of radiation safety and an outcome? What do you think they first said? It's no way. <laughs> So the committee basically is in charge of operations. Everything from the time the surgeon picks up the phone to the time the patient's discharged. All parties are at the table. And this is operational issues, preference cards, bill processing, <coughs> bills management, pre-op preparation, scheduling, operating, turnover time. It's driven by analytics. The biggest thing that happens in this thing is that the surgeons stop being whiners. They're great whiners. Okay, stop being victims and start taking ownership. When I, when I teach this to fellow physicians and they, some of the young analytics people that are running the business, the first word of our engagements, everybody's whining, they're all, including the nurses, I'm, I'm not going to exclude you guys. Everybody's whining, everybody's a victim, you don't understand, we're different, yada yada. Patient safety and a whole bit, you know. And, the first third is all this. The second third is that they start to realize that they don't do something. It's, it's, it, they're now in charge. The last third they take ownership. So they start to change. It's an amazing process. This particular operator room, this is the Surgeon's <coughs> Executive Committee, 87 operators. So they have a large SSMC. It was pretty interesting. All right. So we've got leadership, right? It's, it's, it's you start to have all these different silos coming together, the nursing, the anesthesia, administration, particularly and surgeons are starting at the table. Um, they empower the entire operation of the operator. It's a much different approach. You don't have this end around occurring. They start to take ownership of this stuff. Next level is, is management. How many how many of you I just show me is how many of you have these magnetic boards in your hospital? It's still alive and well throughout the United States. But it really is a primitive way of running an operator. It's kind of an example of how operating samples can run. What it's basically saying is that it's always the last thing in operation. Your schedule gets finished up at one or two o'clock, sometimes never. And then you have it all day long, you're trying to you're pulling people from one room to another room. And then at, at, at three at two thirty, somebody walks into your room, you're in your you're in your you're circulating, but you just sleep for too long. Or you're going to go home tomorrow because you're having cases for you. It's total chaos. <clears throat> we really believe that you're going to have to manage surgeon access very carefully. And that means from a leadership model and a day to day operational model. And we'll talk about this. We believe that the nursing director has to partner with anesthesia. I think it's really important. Most, or let's say, I'll say a large number of operators, anesthesia may square a lot of You know what that means? Come to work, open their locker, put their scrubs on, do their cases, don't bother me, I'm very busy. I'm dying, they're killing me, <laughs> and then they take the scrubs off, and they slam the lock and close, and they're gone. And, you're, and the, the nursing leadership is usually left holding the, the back. Correct? Yeah. It really has to be a collaborative team, and we we really focus on that. So in this committee that we developed, the oversight committee, we used to have a surgeon and an anesthesia medical director, and 
it's amazing. We choose medical anesthesia medical directors not by the chairmanship, by people who want to do this. There's always people that want to do this in your department. Now comes the daily huddle. I think this was in outside Pittsburgh. Um, it was the story behind the daily huddle. We were in Rapid City, North Dakota. I can tell you this was like 20, 20 plus years ago. And the place was like nuts. They had no control of surgical access, there was no schedule. One guy was doing elective joints from midnight to 6 a.m. because he thought it was nice and quiet and wasn't bothered. I mean, it, was, it was crazy. And so the surgeon director of the SSC said, why don't they set up a daily huddle that actually manages the operative proactively and starts raining in some of this crazy behavior? David Drawback was a surgeon. Um, it was so effective that he was going around town by his partners. He now works in North Carolina, probably at one of your hospitals. <laughs> um, anyway, um, the daily huddle is a collaborative group of people that are involved with getting patients in your operative. Okay, I think I'm all right, where are you from? New Hampshire. We have hospitals in New Hampshire. Okay. I was there once. My first first couple of years, I was there. Anyway, so who do you think should be at the daily holiday? That represents the situations that are required to get a patient in the upper room on time before you get to the patient. Yes. Anybody else? Not necessarily. Admitting, scheduling, scheduling, and admitting. What else? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So it's a free operation, operation, patient schedule, uh, materials management that's necessary. A lot of, a lot of them have radiology because all the CR issues, you know, and the, the flashing. So they get the PDR around the phone. Admitting, uh, same day surgery, patient preparation. So you bring together a multidisciplinary team that looks at the schedule, not just the next day, but up to three to five days in advance. You're identifying issues before they hit your operating room and cause late starts and, and poor turnover times. It's very powerful. It works. And if you do it, and if, and if you do it regularly every day, it will become part of your, your DNA. It will be a major. We recommend that at least 70% of your charts are finished three days prior to surgery. But you're not at that level already. We recommend the hunt by it. We are. <laughs> we recommend that 100% of your first case starts are ready by the end of the daily hub. First case starts for the next day. Yeah. What do you think? I'm going to ask, uh, she has a great question. This is Ms. Stanley. Her son is not playing for the Atlanta Falcons. <laughs> <laughs> Second day is very special. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what, what do you think? What would you do if the case was not ready? You have anesthesia, nurse, all these different people are on the table saying, How can you class the nursing home patient? And there's no way you're going to be able to get that nursing home patient in the operating room on time. What do you do? What's that? Yeah, all the phone lines. But you guys don't do that because you don't have a good, a, you don't have the optimal relationship with your offices. It's got to be good. But that certain that SSEC sponsors a lot of this new interaction. Okay, that's the time here. We're, we're moving right, right along. Okay, so the definition of a turn. Now, why are we picking turnover time? It's the hardest thing to make better. It reflects every aspect of your operation. It took me 20 years to figure this out, but I finally have. So we thought, what are we going to do to make this interesting? It's turnover time. What are the surgeons bitch about the most compared to their ASC? So let me in California again. Mm -hmm. Turnover time. Okay, so wheels out. To, there's actually two turnover times. We'll get into that. We recommend, we'll get into the, the benchmarks a little bit further here, but. I still remember, this didn't happen 
I said it's now a fellow in head and neck surgery in, in Toronto, but the first day he walked in the app room, he calls me and goes, what does the anesthesiologist really do? <laughs> so, it's a true story. So, anesthesia emergence, depending on the anesthesiologist, we had an only MD, we had like 56 anesthesiologists at a big hospital, and there was no CRNA. So, so some guys were asleep at the, at the wheel, pressing on, take a half an hour, wake the patient up, have that type of patient, we're recovering intubated, you know, for a, a gallbladder. Any other questions? Go ahead. Over here, over here. Um, the previous slide, you went over really quick. You had standards, yeah. benchmarks. Um, is that surgery center or hospital? Okay. I was the reason I, I glanced over it is because I want to get in much more detail. Okay. The wheels out to wheels in, and I'll, I'll, as long as we're talking about yes, a great question. We had a recent hospital in uh, uh, Dover, Delaware. Um, and they just, uh, you know, well, I'll just show you a slide from there. That um, decided that they were going to uh, scale each tunnel depending upon the specialty. So if you're a, let's say, an eye cataract, what do you think a turnover should be? What's the number? Less than 10 minutes. What about a robot? Is it uh, another robot case following? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. If it's another one's following, it's say 20. At least 20, maybe 30 to 40 minutes. So they actually have index cards they give everybody in the morning. It actually has all the specialties. That's why I wrote this uh, a while ago and I just I decided not to. Uh, and the other thing is case finish, you know, from dressing on to next case cut time. That's a whole other issue. That's, and then we'll get into that slide here. So we have anesthesia emergence, depending on who's, who's given anesthesia, it could be short or relatively long. Then we have room turnover, correct? Which is what you're going to be measuring. However, and then we have anesthesia induction, and then we have start time. However, you have to measure both. You have to measure surgeon turnover time as well as wheels out to wheels in turnover time. We had a hospital in North Carolina. We had a lot of people in North Carolina here. I'm not going to tell you the name of the hospital, very famous place. It was very popular, 29 minute wheels out to wheels in. They had a 118 minute surgeon turnover time. Okay? That's why you have to mention both. And then you have to start getting very granular and who the corners are and who's, who's delaying cases and why we're being delayed. We'll get into that in detail in a moment. Okay. Some of the most common issues. Um, there's a large variation in staff. I typically work alongside a lot of our nursing. We have superb nurse consultants. And so it's, we always approach the consultant as a team. So any nurse performance improvement team or performance improvement team, I'll be with the nurse. And I've watched our nurses over and over again identify after, after about the first or third meeting, somebody in the, in the performance improvement team goes, this is never going to work. We got these people that just will not step up and they're always dragging everybody down. They're always sitting in the lounge. So you have, I call them superstars versus clients. Surgeons will tell you, when I walk into a room and I see the circulating, who's, who's, I hope my day is going to be one. There's a culture of apathy. Staff resists change when challenged. And this is in a hospital operating room. It's much different than an ASC. And there's re you know, reasons. ASCs have defined schedules. Hospitals are constantly adapting to the add-ons. When challenged, they complain of inappropriate production pressure, or they're putting the patient at risk. Right? You're killing it. Uh, and that's why a turnover in her facility for a total joint would be 12 minutes. And why in a hospital operating same case, same cases, it's 40 to 50 minutes. <clears throat> Who they manage surgeon access? You have a crummy block system or a surgeon access system, and there, there's a gazillion add ons that occur. And she had less than 10% of your cases as Less than 10%. You have more than 10% means your schedule is not designed the right way. We spent at least six months redesigning surgeon access. Can you imagine how hard that is? Tell a surgeon you're going to lose your block, or we're going to give you more block, or we're going to take away your, your liberals, and that's it's a whole other issue we're not going to get into. Ineffective management. Wow. 
I, I, if I've heard once, I've heard a thousand times. But we're missing leadership. Won't know anybody accountable. You know, my, my, my staff, you know, the staff, one of my staff will say, you know, you know Susie is a, is, a, is a great nurse, but she gives her time, doesn't breathe, won't speed up, and it's not healthy now. Okay. Um, surgeons and anesthesia get lost. We have, what, why do surgeons <coughs> come to the up? I mean, I can guarantee you, if you have, if you measure your late starts in the morning, 60% of late starts are fitted into surgeons. Do you agree with me on that? Okay, five or six surgeons come out. Don't say because they can't. No, they're using it. They're using it. Yeah, that's right. Why do I get my idea out of that room? Why don't you shut down so they know it's going to be working? So you start, so that our, 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 our message that we give them, and we give the surgeons, and we give the, the nursing teams that, yeah, get your house in order. I'm talking about a very honest day. Then you start holding surgeons in college. Does that make sense? It's amazing. Okay, we, we show these. The easiest thing to fix is on time starts. Because you can always change when people call, and you can get a little flexibility. The hardest thing to fix is turnover times. Uh, case card incomplete, preference cards wrong. This is classic, the serial processing. Don't bring the patient in, I'm still counting. Right? How often do you hear that? Right? And that's, that's not, that's not that advanced. Everybody's, you saw that one picture, everybody's working, there's five people on the room besides the, the PA closing and the, the scrub cup. Those five people, are, it's all parallel process. Patient delays and complete charts. All right, I'm not going to get into all this detail here. This is kind of a, I hate these kind of slides. But every component of this slide is part of the trial time. I mean, you could, you could take a picture of this, but everything on this slide is part of the trial time. Incredibly uh, complicated, lots of issues, lots of things that have to be addressed. That's why building an adaptable culture requires you to address all these different issues. Would you agree? Anything here that you don't think is correct? Then we're moving along. Just okay. There is a defined process, and a lot of people are smarter than it. You know, I have a master's of science in administrative medicine in Wisconsin. Best thing I ever did. Because I learned that business science can sometimes, not all the time, be applied to the effort. So the first thing you have to do when you start to address trouble behind all those different components is to build a burning platform. How do you how do you how do you convince an operator room that if they don't start improving their turnover times, there's gonna be less than 10 million out of 60 million cases in, in the country spending a night or something like that. Or the it's actually 25 million uh, surgeries out of 60 million are actually done in the hospital. With 15 million as outpatients, and over half those of the 15 million, or seven and a half to eight million, can be moved to an ASC. Right now, kind of saying. So you have your competition is, is, is killing you right now. Do you think that's enough to motivate the my staff? So what? I don't like that. I've been here 35 years. I'm not going to change, right? It's the hardest thing to do. Build the burning platform. Our typical consulting interventions were very different than most. We don't hand books out like the advisory group and stuff like that. We actually do through the internal time, so that the actual process that we, all the stuff that we bring in, it takes anywhere six months, what, a year? Sometimes longer. Sometimes longer. Right. I mean, it's been there a lot. I mean, so you really have, it's, it's changed by a thousand grips. <coughs> You have to establish what you want. Then people have to know what their competition is. They have to know what, what the goals are going to be. Right? You build an effective management team, positions and staff that actually hold people accountable. I can't tell you how important it is to keep reminding the staff where you're going. I can tell you that in ASC, I, the last, most of my career was spent in ICUs and uh, you know, very sick patients that dead and dying. The last 10 years I spent in mean, serving all ASCs, all my sports medicine, and our surgery centers. My eyes were open watching all these places. I'll ask you a, a question here. Again, how many of the 
you go to the new surgery center, and there's some great surgeons that move from the hospital, they own this place, and, and the surgeon goes, anybody in the hospital out in LA, come on over, work with us. How many of those people can actually survive working in a fast patient environment? What percent? That comes from hospitals. Right. You're close. About 50 percent of the people that come over from hospitals to work in ACs go back to the hospital because they can't pay the face. There's no to say. <clears throat> in power broadcast, we start with pilots. Get a select group. Get your superstars. You get about the clunkers initially. Part of organizational transformation is you get people starting to lead the way. Now that most people will follow, not all. I will I'll give you a kind of my own personal concept here. Huh? We have a lot of massive organizational transformation that at least 20% of people will never get. And will probably either leave or, 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 or be escalated. Achieve short term win, wins and reward success is really important. The body can ask CNOs, ones that ask them 100 times, why can't we give them some financial reward? If your team is constantly left less than 15 minutes for, for joint turnovers. Why can't I, I, I give you the list of what will be the CRM? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I don't get it for that way. I don't get it because the operator makes most of the money, most of the profit. Uh -huh. However, there are ways of rewarding staff. Consolidate gains, and then finally, your cultural. Change occurs, and that's the process has been changed, and the culture changes. And you constantly have to stay on top of it because entropy will drive you back in. That way. We were in a hospital in the Northeast 12 years ago. They asked us to come back, and we had to redo the whole thing again because they kind of fell back in and had us. Okay, the performance improvement teams are essential. Performance improvement teams. Like the market, is everybody involved in the turnover? Who's involved in the turnover? How about you? How about you? Um, our work leaders, EDS, um, script tech, um, SPD. It's it just like a hub. Yeah. Okay. Turnover times are complicated events. You saw that slide with all those little boxes and stuff. Everybody that's involved in the turnover has to be. Preference card still processing. Everybody has to be. And then you go through, you build, you build the process as the ideal process. You know, you have swim lanes. What's your role down the last What are you supposed to do? You're not supposed to get lost. You're supposed to get machine set up, get your car set up. So the leaders what they're supposed to do and when they're supposed to do. We have very, very defined process. And everybody has a, has a job. And then you start the pilots. The best pilots are ones where you have a nurse educator that's actually watching the pilot. You know, actually looking how everybody's going to turn off the team and everything gets together. They, they talk about it, it's definitely one of these boys, but it's, 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 it's a long term process. Get your pilot down and start the experience. Okay, so this is that hospital we talked about, we went back to in the Northeast. And this is the hospital also that developed the index cards. And they had a very strong anesthesia nursing collaboration. You don't see this in every hospital. So this was kind of a, a good, good place to start. So you can see when we started, we started the intervention in December of last year, right? Right. right. These are the turnover times as we move through it. Actually, this says 29 minutes here. We just got an update with 24, 24 minute average turnover time. This is a unbelievably, uh, this is one of the best response we ever had. Of course, we're going to show you our good stuff, you know, uh, but. We, we expect at least a 20 to 25 percent improvement in internal times by the time we do. Okay, a couple of caveats. Be patient. It's going to take time. You're not going to change the culture and process. Of, and it takes, remember we said, six months to a year. We talked about choreographing each other person's role. Physician participation is the key. If you don't have anesthesia stepping up, you don't have surgeons getting involved in running this SSDC and holding people accountable, you get it. Might as well not even start. Um, be specific at each turnover time. That's what we talked about, right? Be specific on what you want. 
create a plan before leaving the room, display progress. We have signs up everywhere. We're going to show you a great example here. We'll have a few minutes for questions. Um, this is a hospital in again, North Carolina. Uh, and they took term times to another level. Uh, who has a second term? Who has a second Who has a second term? There's four data points that you need. You need <coughs> pressing on, wheels out, wheels in, and cut on. Right? That's all you need. And they took it. It was relatively simple. I mean, we're showing you this because they, they have their SSEC that we, we installed. They have their huddles and everything else, the huddles. And, but they were able to, you don't see this in CERT, or you don't see this in Meditech, you don't see this in, in Epic, but they, these are four simple data points. They pulled off, and they were able to look at every single rule in their operating room. There's 18, if I'm not mistaken, 18 um, operating rooms they started every morning in this hospital. And they started looking at individual times. So what they did was they they established what they're going back to you. They established what the, their expected turnover time was going to be. This is in room time green, turnover time is yellow. And if they exceeded either the on, first case on time start or the turnover time, it would show up as red. Very, very visually powerful. We do the same thing, we do it on, it's not as visually powerful, but this is the 18 rooms. This is a day, this is a start right here, and this is through the day. What do you see here? You see a well-run operating room. For the most part, there's red, and they measure the number of the minutes, room utilization, and the turnover time is 27 minutes uh, for this particular day. I think it's really powerful to see visually. You have to get a, this immediate feedback. Really start, and the staff really enjoyed this because it's almost like a game. When the system shut down and it didn't work, people said, let's get it back up. So what's interesting now, they were picked by North Carolina had, as having the most efficient productive operating in the state. Now they're on a 20 minute turn. And nobody feels like there's production pressure, but the patients are at risk. Because then you think, and they have good feedback. So this, this is an extreme example of what's necessary in the future. This is what's happening every day, I guess. Excuse me. Question. Go ahead. <coughs> it looks like every case was perfectly scheduled. Uh, is there any way to indicate that this case was underbooked and ran? Excellent question. All right. So let's go to the next slide here. Every day they have their daily huddle where they're going over, constantly tweaking, you know, the scheduling, admitting, uh, they're looking at times, what are we seeing here today? You know, and so they're constantly tweeting. So your, your question is totally appropriate. Um, so they're they're constantly and they're getting data that they they, they accumulate and they look at it. who's chronically late, who, who who's chronically one. If that is not scheduling them correctly, are they using the correct CPG codes? Are they not using CPG codes? I mean, it's always it, it's not something. It's not an on-off switch. You don't you don't change turn times in one day. It's, it's constant effort. But if you can if you can make your hospital special in terms of efficiency, productivity, quality of patient care, it's all about quality of patient care. You think national knowledge necessarily be patient care. It's how you do it. If, if you're reckless, I remember we were in a hospital it's about 50 years ago. And so we're there with our in fact, you were in the room with me. We were in Newburgh. And we had our we had our phones out and we were taking pictures and you know, we looked like we were really important consultants. And we had a, a, a joint joint panel, remember that? And it was like 55 people and fighting over the guard. You know, so the, the Hawthorne effect was alive and well. You don't want that. You want your day to day operating. You don't want you want to work like you do when you're <coughs> missing something in your hospital. You know what I'm saying? So we can expect the check missions there, suddenly everybody looks good, you know, for the most part. Some of the separate. All right, so the question was totally appropriate. You have to constantly tweak it. This took them four years to get to this point. Okay, a lot of tweaking, a lot of heartburn, a lot of. Uh, and now they have the most efficient hospital 
in the state of North Carolina, probably one of the most efficient hospitals in the country. Her staff rarely works overtime. Her staff rarely goes home for unpaid time off. It's how you manage the operating capacity and manage the service needs. Not fine. Is this architecture the same place, but I don't see it. It's all the entire outcome. Every one of them. We have the same, we don't show this is on the screen, but we have The more you can have people get real time feedback on what they're doing, the better off it's going to be. But, you know, you're, you're, you're always facing, it's always up to the middle. What's the first, what's the first get answer out of a chief information officer's mouth when you ask them if we could do something like this? No. No, 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 that's very <laughs> So it, 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 it's, it's a, it's a, you, know, you have to build this from the ground up, create the need, create the learning platform, and then the hospital administration realizes that they're going to make, it's all about the money, I'm sorry, they're going to have great patient care and good efficiency and productivity. We're going to go for this. This hospital is kicking butt with everybody around it. And surgeons can't get, they can't, they don't even have any more room left. Like, no more right. When you briefly mentioned about starting a process like this with champions, like how do you get the buy in for an entire department to do something like this? It, it always seems like no matter where you are, there's going to be Okay, great. Who's the most important thing? Okay, you're how much it, uh, do you have a question for that? How much it? Uh, so, how is that going to be another permit? Transparency to the advisory that we have now. You guys know that this play is every year. But the more transparency they see, then people can see what's going on or not going on. And we can react together instead of it being uniform. So, his question is totally appropriate. How do you develop the urgency within your organization to get something like this off if they don't know what's going on, if they don't know you're keeping score. I'm talking about how do you, I think he's talking, are you saying how do you get your hospital administration to buy it? No, I'm actually going to so like the staff. Yes. Hey, think about it, think about it. You become, and I don't work in a union hospital, but there it's union, but it's like, well, if we become more efficient, we'll get more work. It's, it's, I mean, I hear this every day. Well, if we finish this case first, we're getting that out. Yeah. You know, so if we take our time and go through it, and then, you know, and that's how we're um, I hear it all the time. What it, 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 it's just it's ridiculous. Every single hospital in the country has the same problems. How would you approach it out? I have an answer, but it's sometimes better to give me an idea. What do you think? Is it just everybody just. It's, remember what we said, as a little film. You, you start with leadership management process. I keep going back to this, I can't stress this enough. <laughs> you have the administration, surgeons, surgical leadership, and anesthesia and nursing leadership suddenly saying, this is not acceptable. Okay? You empower frontline management to start what's called accountability. Accountability, accountability. You get anesthesia, you put the locker center, step up and start thinking, I will never allow a nurse at the front desk to be paraded. I like stories. Okay. Every Saturday morning, Jerry Barr was a nurse surgeon in the hospital. He would walk up the front desk and he would look at, the, at Bridget and he would say, I have an emergency carpal tunnel. I've got a pump area. <laughs> 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 because you have to have an office behind the clock. So, and that was how the other worked. And so it was a bad approach. Just what Jerry was going to do. And I said, that's got to stop. So we brought in the, the Service service executive committee, which we built, and then Jerry now had to report to his peers, right? Yeah. So Jerry suddenly went out and you know, like, uh, stopped doing that. But we had the phantom, uh, Vic the track to me every Saturday, uh, John Smith. Uh, was on, every Saturday was scheduled by the South Carolina. So we have four at nine members. You know, that's right. It starts with leadership, where when the administration starts to recognize the operations are being done very poorly. Go ahead. You have a question for that? Okay, so it starts with that. And then you start empowering people to make decisions. I learned 
when I approached Jerry Bobber for the first time, I said, Jerry, you can't do this. If this person loses their hand because you didn't do this in our I'm going to blame you. I thought to myself, you know what? I don't have any support. And I look around, it's like I'm twisting with a wind here. And, you know, I, I, so that's when I, I recognized his peers had to be in hold him accountable. And so you're actually right. Those people that swing on production pressure, right, and patient safety, and if I do another case, you're, it, most of those, those, those problems will go away um, if you have a very fair system of certain access. Cut down your ad on <coughs> So your offices now stop the last minute they went from the big four and the right down and the skipper for a couple of years. They're around like nut case, right? They don't realize that they would never do that to their ASC. Now, okay, so with all this that they did there, they improved all these all these different you know metrics. Improve the hospitals make it a gazillion dollars and everybody's happy and the nurses are getting bonuses big bonuses for you know, for uh, for the improvement activity property growth so i'm going to stop there and please i would like to thank you for listening to us for this hour and any questions go ahead you have a robust prior to the day of surgery process do you have a Yes. Really good, robust prior to the day of surgery process. <coughs> yes, everything's choreographed from the time the patient's scheduled to the patient's We look at every aspect and bring it all down to the patient care. So is that done by a phone call to the patient? Is it done by coming into a clinic? I need that. Good question. All right, what percentage of your patients think that should be probably can be with a phone call and a great screen? For most hospital hours, that's what they do. What percent of patients can go directly to the hospital? They're basically outpatients, and go directly to the operating room without having to see. Ours is 100%. We do all phone screens for every case. Okay, so what happens if you have a complicated case? We can mitigate it through a phone call and through. So, would you have like, you send it to the primary care doctor or you? Surgery is the primary care, they get a cardiac and the high or the the department. I'm going to be very honest with you, I don't like that approach because every surgeon office has a different approach. And so we believe in centralizing patient care and having one consistent approach governed by the anesthesia with the anesthesia department. We have all the different based stuff and the best algorithms. Every surgeon is expected, every surgeon can manage.